Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Alright, if you could come to order, please. Um, this is the May 4th, 2020, 9 a.m. meeting of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Present today in the um, meeting room, I'm uh, Amy Scott Gailey, I'm the chair. We also have Vice Chair Commissioner Steve Carter and um, Commissioner Bill Lashley. Joining us by phone remotely today, we have Commissioner Tim Sutton. Mr. Sutton, are you, can you hear me? Present. And we have Commissioner Eddie Boswell. Commissioner Boswell, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Great, thank you so much. And I wanna especially thank Mr. Sutton and Mr. Boswell for agreeing to participate remotely so that we can have a quorum present and still attend to the business of the county um, during this time of the governor's stay at home order limiting groups to gatherings of no more than 10. So also present in the room today, we have our clerk, Tori Frank, our county attorney, um, Pod Albright, county manager, Brian Haygood. Uh, we have our uh, public health director, Stacey Saunders, and we have a person with, I'm not sure what your name is. I'm Jana Elliott. Jan Elliott with the health department. Good to see you this morning. And we also have Bruce Walker, who's uh, assistant county manager and also head of our IT department. So I am told that at the beginning of the meeting, I'm supposed to say who's in here so that people will know. Uh, so this morning, uh, Commissioner Lashley, could you lead us in an invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I'd like to. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pause at this time to honor you. We thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the many blessings that you share with share with us each and every day. We ask you to for a special uh, thank you to all those people with first responders, our, our nurses, our doctors, and all those that helps us with health care. We also ask you for your guidance as we prepare the people's business around Mass County. These things we pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Business is to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Okay, Mr. Lashley is moved approval of the agenda and Mr. Carter has seconded it. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please no. say aye. Uh, aye. Uh, Anyone opposed? The agenda is approved. Next item is uh, approval of the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Mr. Lashley has moved for approval of the consent agenda and Mr. Carter has seconded. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. All right, the first item of business today is, uh, is Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month. And so I am going to have a procl proclamation that I'm going to read about that um, for, you know we've uh, enjoyed having the motorcycle safety group uh, here in the past and unfortunately because of the virus that's not possible today so uh, i'm going to read the proclamation <clears throat> elements county board of commissioners proclamation for motorcycle safety awareness month for may 2020 whereas as more and more residents are turning to motorcycles as a form of transportation and with the warmer weather approaching, it is time to remind property owners to do their part to keep grass clippings and yard debris off the of roadways and encourage drivers to be alert and share the road with motorcyclists and other types of small vehicles. And whereas the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Motorcycle Safety 
have named May as Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month, and May is traditionally the time that the number of motorcycles on roadways increases. And whereas motorcycle riding, riding is not only a popular form of recreation and transportation for thousands of citizens across North Carolina and Alamance County, but an economical means of transportation that reduces fuel consumption, road wear, and helps to alleviate traffic and parking congestion. And whereas North Carolina has over 193,000 registered motorcycles and more than 177,000 licensed drivers who have either a motorcycle endorsement or a motorcycle learner's permit, and whereas across the state in 2018, there were 3,461 motorcycle-related crashes that resulted in 169 fatalities and 2,722 motorcyclists seriously injured. And whereas it is important that the citizens of North Carolina and Alamance County be aware of motorcycles on our roadways and recognize the importance of motorcycle safety and share the roadways. And whereas the safe operation of a motorcycle is enhanced through a combination of rider training and experience, good judgment, and a knowledge of traffic laws and licensing requirements and the use of highly visible safety gear. And whereas several organizations, such as the Alamance County Concerned Bikers Association, along with the North Carolina Motorcycle Safety Education Program, and other state and local motorcycle clubs and riding social clubs, are committed to increasing the safe operation of motorcycles by promoting rider safety education programs. And whereas Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month is designed to increase public awareness about motorcycles and safety, safely sharing the road with motorcycles and to encourage their safe and proper use among motorcycle riders. Now, therefore, be it resolved that we, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, do hereby proclaim the month of May as Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month in Alamance County, North Carolina, and urge all citizens to join in this effort to promote awareness, mutual respect, and safety on our roads. Signed this 20th day of April 2020. So, uh, Clerk Frank, I think that you had a letter from the Motorcycle Safety Group to read. May 4, 2020, to the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. On behalf of the Concerned Bikers Association of Alamance County, we gratefully accept the 2020 proclamation officiating May as Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month. In turn, we would like to present the board with a certificate of appreciation and recognition for your acknowledgement and support of the motorcyclist community beyond just the month of May. Your efforts to encourage motorist safety and a heightened awareness of motorcyclists on the roadways within our county continues to provide a sense of security for the riders that live and visit here. And we cannot thank you enough for that. As the community grows, we look forward to continuing to build an even stronger relationship with area and state lawmakers as well as the peace officers in order that safe ridership be maintained locally and beyond. With respect and gratitude, Ori Holt President and the Concerned Bikers Association Alamance Chapter. Great. County Manager. I think we have a copy of the cer Certificate of Appreciation and we'd okay. like to give that to the Commissioners, and I think Scott Ward would like to get a picture yeah, also. Yeah. Okay. Can we get a picture together? So we don't need a picture with the proclamation. That would be good. Give that I'll take a picture. Okay. Well, let me take off my glasses, Bruce. I don't plan on being in the picture.
All right, and before we go on to the next item of the agenda, I have made a mistake. We did, I skipped over public speakers, and we have one email from a resident who I believe, uh, from talking to the clerk, he and the clerk, and there were some items related to not really one particular agenda item, but uh, several thoughts about items on the agenda. So I think that what we should probably do is uh, I will make a motion that we um, amend the agenda to include the public speakers at this time. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to amend the agenda to do the public speakers now. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you, and I apologize for that um, error of mine. Uh, could you please read the public comment? This is from George Adams, 317 Bendy Drive. Public comment topic budget amendments. ACC budget request includes pay raises and new positions. Five million for courthouse and general repairs and renovation. Petrie building contract for 2.4 million for room for social services staff. Is the social service building on Graham Hopedale Road not big enough for all the staff? Please remember that even if you get your way, and Governor Cooper begins to open back up on May 8th, all the restaurant people and hair salon people will have lost months of income while county government continues to draw ample paychecks and other benefits. Due to the pandemic, no increases in salary or taxes should transpire. All right, thank you. And again, I apologize for uh, skipping over that earlier. All right, the next thing on our agenda, or do we have any responses to the public comment? Do you, Mr. Sutton or Mr. Boswell, do you have a response to the public comment? No comment. Great, thank you. Um, so the next item on our agenda is a COVID-19 update from Stacy Saunders, our public health director. Good morning. Good morning. So at this time I'm doing it a little differently um, and have a formal presentation for you. Um, so I'll be facing sort of this direction, so I apologize for those on this side. <coughs> All right, so um, I wanted to go through a little bit of the current landscape um, of the global um, response um, and also our local response uh, with you all. Um, so first, um, as of yesterday, so um, everything, all the numbers you're gonna see are gonna be from yesterday, um, since um, we'll, we're now looking at all of our test results um, this morning, and so we'll be giving an update later today um, with our most current numbers, but all of this is from yesterday. So um, globally, about 3.5 million cases have been confirmed with 244,000 deaths. Um, within the United States, we've reached about 1.1 million cases um, with 66,000 deaths. Um, here in North Carolina, as of yesterday, it was 11,644 cases with 422 deaths. And then um, locally, as of yesterday, we had 123 um, confirmed cases cumulatively. So from the beginning, when we first um, identified our first case on March 20th, um, of those 123, 57 have since been released from isolation, um, which as I mentioned the last time I presented to you all, um, is that minimum of seven days from onset um, with symptoms improving and then an additional 72 hours um, with no fever or um, any uh, increase in symptoms. And so um, I just wanted to mention also because Mr. Sutton had asked last time about um, the uh, release from isolation and the recovery. We, we're referring to it as release from isolation. And um, I, I did some math and found out that um, our average is about 14 days, um, but the range is as high as 29 days. So I just wanted to add that. Um, 
Of those cumulative confirmed cases, 64 remain active and are in isolation, and six of those active cases are receiving care in a hospital. And unfortunately, um, and very sadly, uh, we've had two deaths associated with COVID-19 thus far. And I know um, folks are really interested in how the breakdown um, happens within our county, and one of the things as your case count increases that gives you a much better data set to um, stratify and um, get some um, granular like data for, for you all to review. So with that, um, this is the cumulative cases breakdown by race and ethnicity. And so what you'll see is um, the green um, columns that you see up there are the um, total population of Alamance County, the percent um, of that racial group. The blue lines are the percent of Alamance County confirmed cases. And then the yellow is the uh, percent of North Carolina confirmed cases. And so you can see um, locally that um, our cases are mostly um, in white individuals, but we do have a significant number um, of African Americans um, that is exceeding slightly our general population percentage. Um, and you can see from the state, um, theirs is um, quite a bit higher. And then at the end of that graph is the ethnic groups. Um, and so it's just the two, in Hispanic and non-Hispanic. Um, and you can see um, our total percentage of that, our Alamance County total population is about 13% um, Hispanic. They identify 13% Hispanic. Um, and our um, cases are around 20 20% um, a little bit over that. And then um, the non-Hispanic is the last one. So next is the cumulative case uh, breakdown by age. Um, and so this mimics um, the way that the state is reporting their age breakdown as well. Um, you don't have percentage of Alamance County uh, population broken down this way because uh, the census does it a little differently. So for consistency, we just follow the state. Um, and the blue lines are the state cases, percents of the state cases that are in that age group, and the green are the Alamance County confirmed cases. And so, you know, the distribution is not too different than what we see at the state level with very little um, cases being in the uh, less than 18-year-old um, and I'm, the contributing factor there could be that um, the schools have not been, we've not been sending children to school and they've been schooling at home. So less exposure, um, therefore less infection. Um, uh, Stacy, could you pause for a second? Sure. I've gotten a communication that the volume is not working on the stream. Oh, I'm sorry. Fixed it. It's been fixed? Yeah, it's about six in the last okay, great. three minutes. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Go ahead, sorry to interrupt. No, no worries. Um, the rest of the distribution isn't, isn't that different, although we're a little higher locally in that 50 to 64 year, year old range than the state. And then the cumulative cases by zip code, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services um, modified their um, dashboard just this past week to include zip code. That's the map you see on the left. Um, and that's an interactive map. Um, folks can go to that website um, and click on it and go into their zip code. Um, I have given DHHS feedback that county lines would be very helpful. And so um, just using that map and you know the data that we have, uh, folks can look at that map if they choose. What we did is um, took a, the most common um, zip codes and put them in the chart to the right um, with the Burlington 27217 um, zip code being um, the highest burden of cases, um, which is includes Burlington, Glen Raven, Green, Green Level, Stony Creek, Pleasant Grove, followed by um, 27217, which is Burlington, Elon, and Gibsonville, and then uh, followed by 27253, which is Burlington, some of Burlington, Graham, um, Sachs Paw, and Swepsonville, and then um, 27302, which is um, Mebane and Hall River. And then there are just some smaller ones um, that have single digit percentages. And this is um, 
the new cases by day epi curve. So there are lots of epi curves um, that are out um, floating around and some on the DHHS website. And um, many of them, some of the ones you've seen so far are the cumulative cases curve. And that will always go up because cumulative, cumulative means they're going to add to it. So that number just keeps going up. The new cases by day um, is actually um, a really good indicator of how that peak is going to go. And so that blue line you see that's all zigzag and all over the place are the absolute numbers of new cases each day. Um, and you can see it fluctuates greatly. Sometimes we have one case, sometimes we have two, sometimes we have nine that come in um, daily to the health department. So it's really hard to discern anything from that blue line. Um, it's not very pretty. And um, that's why we have the green, which is the smooth regression line. Um, and even that is um, a little less smooth than I would like it, uh, mainly because um, we're still, there's still, um, there's still low numbers daily that come in. But that green regression line is actually um, a seven day average. So it looks at the three days before that particular day's cases, that day's cases, and the three days after to create a seven day average to help smooth out that line and create an actual trend. Um, so that we're not seeing those um, peaks and valleys as much. And so you can see early on, um, before our first case was identified on March 20th, and so you can see that line um, you know, slowly creeping up, slowly creeping up, and it was around um, um, April 20th that we saw that um, line go up significantly and has plateaued just a little, and then is starting to uh, go back up again. So um, as access to collection and testing increases, um, that line, the more we test, the more we're likely to find. Um, and so that line um, likely will go up a little bit more in the next um, couple of weeks. And then ideally what we would see is the daily um, increase of new cases go back down. And so we would I would ideally see a, a nice curve. Um, it's likely to be low and slow, which is what we want. Um, so instead of a really high peak, it'll likely be um, more like a plateau at that point. So um, can we uh, talk a little bit more about how much testing has happened and how much is going on? So I think you just said this, but I want to emphasize it that around April 21st, April 19th, we, we were, had access to more tests. Is that right? So um, what's been happening in the community is uh, we have several providers who are collecting health department being one, uh, Piedmont Health Services being another, and then other private providers who are collecting. Um, Cone, um, up, up until um, just a few days ago, uh, was limiting some of their testing for those who were going to be hospitalized, which was guidance that they had received. And so um, as Cone, our hospital partner, opened up some of their collection, we started to see more folks getting tested. We're in a unique sort of situation here in Alamance where we have a large hospital system to the west of us um, and um, two um, to the right of us. So folks have lots of opportunities now. So some of our folks have gotten their um, collection, their tests collected at UNC or even Duke. And so there's, um, if folks have transportation to those sites, then um, they're able to get those tests a little bit more readily. Um, and so that's part of it, is, and we're working with our partners in Piedmont Health Services and Cone Health to increase that collection access even more and potentially looking at neighborhoods or other communities where transportation might be uh, limited, where insurance might be limited, uh, where access to many things might be limited, um, and trying to get collection out to um, the community in that way. So that's in the works. Great. Thank okay. you. Yes. Could you uh, address, too, I've had a number of people ask about who knows who has the, the coronavirus, and I know you and I have talked about the issue of communicating to law enforcement and so forth. Mm -hmm. Can you address that so the public can have a better idea? Sure. I've had some people ask me if they can't find out if a tenant has it or something of that nature. And right. Um, so in general, um, even in a communicable disease outbreak, um, individuals still have rights um, and rights to privacy and HIPAA protects those and there are state laws that protect them as well um, and so 
publicly, like just to the general public, um, the likelihood of releasing people's names or addresses is very small. It would, it would have to be some really unprecedented times, I think, for that to happen. And so in general, you're not going to see anybody, you won't see people release names or addresses. But there is a provision within those laws that protect people's privacy that allows us to share with dispatch. Because in a communicable disease response, you do want to make sure that your first responders have access, uh, knowledge ahead of time so that they can don their protective equipment right. um, and not um, expose themselves, right? And so uh, we are allowed to share with dispatch the active cases. So when an active case comes into um, our workflow, we notify dispatch, both Alamance County Dispatch in Burlington, and um, that is flagged so that, um, and only the dispatch folks know that. It's not given to individual officers, it's not given um, to the sheriff, it's not given to the chief of police. It's just dispatch, and that dispatch um, section has to treat it the same way that the health department would. So essentially they become an extension of the health department, um, right. and they have to treat that information just the same as we would, uh, which is uh, that they're not allowed to share it um, just because they want to, um, that the only time they share it is when they get a call when they get a 911 call and that individual says, um, I live here, and so when they then um, deploy the first responders, they can say to the first responder, this is this flag, you need to make sure that you have masks, gloves, these sort of things. Right. So that's how we share. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And just to recap, these are um, just some you know, bullet points of the things that are happening. Um, we continue to do the case investigation and contact tracing. So um, as I've mentioned before, that's when we identify a positive case and that positive case uh, gets fully worked up with their history, where they've been, um, how long they've had symptoms, what their symptoms are, um, and um, who they've been around. And so <coughs> after a full investigation of the case, we uh, take those close contacts of theirs um, and begin following up with them. So all cases and um, close contacts are followed up by the health department daily. The cases are followed up to be sure that their symptoms are improving um, or if they're getting worse that we can help um, coordinate uh, additional services for them. And then the contacts are um, also contacted every day um, to see if they are developing symptoms. And if they are, um, then they become a person of interest um, and um, we can uh, send them for collection of tests at that point. Um, I mentioned the increased access to collection and testing. Um, we've been working with our hospital and um, federally <coughs> qualified health center uh, partners to increase that access. That's also one of the goals um, that the governor has for his um, plan. So there's probably likely to be more about that coming in the next coming weeks about how to increase that collection and testing capacity. Um, many of our commercial labs um, have indicated that they have uh, more capacity now than they did in the beginning to test, so the more they can take more of those collections. Um, the community call center continues to operate, uh, and thus far um, they've had 1,912 calls to the call center, and then um, 680 of those have been referred to the nurse call center at the health department um, as sort of a nurse triage or health triage, so when folks ask about medical or health-related questions. Um, our long-term care facility task force continues to meet and to work with long-term care facilities. Uh, we actually just did a large collection event um, for long-term care facility employees because it's a lot easier for them to come through a drive-through than for us to go back and forth into a long-term care facility during shifts. Um, we want to make sure that we limit the amount of time and the number of encounters that our residents at long-term care facilities have. So this was a much more effective and efficient way to get those long-term care facility staff who are a high priority um, uh, group for collection. Additionally, um, the health department through our medical director will be working to create a collaborative um, between Cone Health, um, UNC, and the long-term care facilities and the health department just to um, have continual communication with each other around protocols and surge capacity and things that long-term care facilities may need to help prevent or mitigate an outbreak. We did have um, 
one identified outbreak this week, uh, this past week, um, in a long-term care facility. And just a reminder that Department of Health and Human Services will be reporting bi-weekly on specific um, long-term care facility outbreaks on their website. I think it's Tuesday and Friday that that gets um, updated around four o'clock. Um, the Housing Task Force has created two subgroups now, one um, uh, charged with housing for folks who might be, might be housing insecure and need to be quarantined or um, isolated, but also a second work group around food insecurity. What we found is um, some of our cases that um, it's not easy to ask somebody to isolate um, for the whole time, and that might mean that they don't have enough food um, in their house and they may not have a strong support system or family in the area to help um, support their food needs. So that task force is working with some community partners, including um, United Way, um, to make sure that food security um, is addressed. And then uh, one of the other pieces is the Essential Personnel Child Care Support Task Force, which um, created the, little day, the day camps for folks who needed um, child care services. I think that's it for me. Go ahead, um. Not yet. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Sutton. Okay. Are you there? Yes, sir. I wish the bad part about this morning is I have to be at home on, due to my own choosing, but I wish I could be there to look you in the eyes and tell you what a trooper you are. Thank you, sir. Amen to that. Yes, sir. And my hat's off to you, and uh, God bless you. Oh, I appreciate um, that. Two questions. Uh, <clears throat> I was over at Kernodal Clinic the other day for a uh, normal continuation of uh, me seeing them uh, off and on. And there, the tents were outside, you know, for the uh, testing. Yes. yes, sir. And I was like... I drove by in my car and I rolled down my passenger's window and I didn't want to blow the horn, <laughs> so I just sat there. I figured somebody would see me. And a nurse did walk over and she asked, could she help me? And I said, well, uh, not so much as I just need information or want information. Now I looked at her and I said, if somebody came, because there was nobody there. I mean, there was nobody at the tents except people in the tents, obviously workers that I could tell. And I said, if somebody came over and wanted to be tested, what would you do? And she looked at me and she said, well, we would call out a doctor. They don't have to have, a, they don't have, to have an appointment, she said. They would call out a doctor and a doctor would, I don't know what he does at that point or she, but, and they move forward. Now, number one, is there any charge for a citizen to go through that particular situation? I'm unsure if there's going to be a charge if you go through um, a private uh, group like Kernodal. Um, now, for those who are insured, um, that that could all be um, submitted to the insurance company, and then um, Blue Cross Blue Shield has actually decided that they're going to waive those um, if it's COVID um, testing or COVID um, collection. And so many insurance companies um, have done that as well. I'm unsure if there's a charge for the Kernodal piece. Um, I will tell you that depending on the criteria, so at the health department, if you're high risk or high priority in showing symptoms, that means you're eligible for us to send it to the state lab. Um, and that you know, typically does not come at a cost. Um, but for lots of folks who are insured, they can contact their local primary care provider and if the pr primary care provider is collecting, has the capacity to collect in their office, they could do it there in the office or refer them to a site um, where, they're, where they are collecting. Um, many of the sites do require a doctor's note or a telemed type of um, um, encounter in order, because they need you to be physically assessed in some way before. Um, some of the early drive-through um, collection sites even needed um, telemed or some type of doctor's note. Um, but I can find out for you if there are charges um, with different with different groups. What's the typical charge? Um, you can see. 
pick it up. I'm not going to be able to hear you. Yeah. So um, Jana, our um, assistant director of operations, does our uh, business officer piece. She was saying that LabCorp charges about a hundred dollars. Okay. Well, that's fairly inexpensive for uh, um, for your health. Uh, let me get now. Could I go to another question, please? Absolutely. And my pharmacy's on the other line, so I'll just let them wait. Uh, anyway, uh, that distracted me. I apologize. It's quite obvious with the zip codes, uh, if you zero in on the cities or the regions, the divisions as to their, not necessarily numerical, well, I guess, yeah, numerical is shown. But as far as minimal, average, or not average, but medium, to high, to, to nothing, I suppose. In other words, for, for the lack of better words, hot spots, possibly. And, you know, in any operation where you have things that you're surveying and you have hot spots and you want to minimize it, average it out, drop it, whatever, minimize the hazards, whatever, you go in and do something about it. And are there, is the state, i.e. our county, going into any of these higher concentrated zip code areas with more information or information that will, will, will help in that? Yeah, um, so that's a great- arena. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the answer is uh, yes. So Secretary Cohen created the um, two work groups, one being the testing surge capacity and then the contact tracing and um, the contact tracing capacity work groups. And both of those work groups um, are charged with not only thinking about how do you generally increase capacity to collect or generally increase contact tracing, but how do we um, also then um, address marginalized communities or communities that have, um, you know, disparities when it comes to either either COVID infection or, or even comorbidity. So there is a group thinking through that. Um, now I will tell you locally, um, we've been in contact with our hospital partners and our federally qualified health center partners about how do we um, address COVID-19 in our most vulnerable populations where, you know, they, these vulnerable populations are also um, you've heard me talk, you know, when I talk about the community health assessment, that some of these vulnerable populations are our highest with um, chronic disease too, heart disease, um, diabetes, and that um, those so the same social drivers that are driving those chronic diseases are likely driving um, infection rates for um, around, you know, across the United States um, with the infection rates too. Um, and so, yes, the answer is yes. Um, we're discussing that with community partners to figure out how do we do that and leveraging some of those relationships that the health department, the hospital, and the FQHC have already built with communities. Um, and so more to come on that, but the answer is yes. Um, and that the charges for many communities around the state um, to begin thinking about that too, particularly around how do we increase access to collection and thereby testing uh, but also then um, once we collect and test, that means we find more. And then how do we help communities really um, sustain and successfully do contact tracing in order to contain? And so that, you know, that's the whole piece around public health is to identify cases, um, their close contacts, and contain um, the infection um, as much as possible. I would assume with zip codes, uh, it would probably cost a fortune. I'm not sure with zip codes, literature could be mailed to a degree if it, if it hasn't already been, and it'd be literature that it's easy to read, not mm -hmm. so complicated, four pages and so forth right. and so on. Um, I'm just, just shooting off the top of my head. I'll, I'll let you go with this. Thank you again, but I'll go to Greensboro. I'm in Durham a lot, and it's clear beyond a shadow of a doubt that certain areas certain neighborhoods are totally not even thinking there's a, a, an issue at least where they're at versus another side of town or wherever another neighborhood where it's like you're in a different world mm -hmm. 
And uh, uh, let me tell one story. I was in Greensboro the other day and went through Irving Park. I go through there a lot. I was stunned to see, I would say, in a three-street circle of a block or a square of a block. In other words, I didn't go on the fourth one. And that's a very affluent neighborhood in Greensboro, probably the most affluent. I bet I could, could have counted. I wanted to go back and take a picture. Forty women. And not knocking around at all. But that's what I saw. Walking up the sidewalk, clearly in groups of two, three, clearly there was no concern about distancing, pushing baby strollers out for a an afternoon walk. With and not a one had on a mask. And I thought, that is so unbelievable compared to where else I could go and see totally the opposite. You you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And I see that in Durham. Over at Duke. You go over, was over on the East Campus the other day, and not a soul acted like there was anything going on. But you could go somewhere else in Durham and see the total opposite. And I just don't know if this, uh, I'll leave it at that. But thank you for what you do. Thank you, sir. Mr. Boswell, do you have AP, I would like to, uh, Amy, if I could, I'd like, I got a couple questions and a comment, too. Of course, go ahead. Uh, Friday, I was watching the state uh, going through their cases and all that. They had a uh, graph showing number of confirmed tests or confirmed cases versus number of tests given. And just my opinion as a layman, not a doctor or anything, to me, that is a very accurate number because the more testing we've done, just as your graph showed, we didn't have many cases at the beginning of the month, uh, of March or any of that. And now we've got a lot more cases, but we've done a lot more testing. Mm -hmm. Do you ever use that graph? So the, I know what graph you're talking about. Um, I do look at the state's dashboard um, several times a day. Um, I will say that locally, um, Trying to duplicate that locally is a little harder. Um, it's even harder at the state, and here's why. Um, that those are the, so you've heard me say before that any positive test um, must be, shall, uh, shall be reported to the local health department, but negative cases right. don't have to be. And so um, the more we can get um, testing sites to report, to report those negative tests into the state da database, the more likely we're to get we are to get a better denominator. And so um, our denominator currently in the county would probably not really give us the full picture. Um, and, and at the state level, it's probably not either, although it's much more, it's a bigger number and more labs are feeding into that from different parts of the um, state. Um, we keep thinking about that one. And so I, I will tell you, it, that's one that interests me as well. Um, I just don't have a very good way of doing that locally yet because of the um, inconsistent inconsistency uh, with reporting out negatives. But I'm hoping we'll get closer to that. Okay, very good. Also, uh, on the testing for the nursing home people, is that is that the rapid test that they're doing on them, or what what is that? No, sir. Um, so the the collection event um, still will utilize the PCR, which is essentially the gold standard. And so um, the collection event um, still utilize the nasopharyngeal um, collection swab. And then um, those, those, te those collection, collected specimens were sent to either the state lab or to uh, LabCorp. And so no, they weren't using the rapid ones yet. Um, now, I will tell you, our partners at Cone Health use a Cepheid, a rapid Cepheid um, instrumentation, which is doing a 45-minute uh, rapid PCR, um, and they're using that in their lab, and that's aiding them um, when they're hospitalizing folks um, or, you know, trying to decide um, care for them. And so our, our local hospital is using that. Okay. I was, I was curious because you're checking the workers going into the rest mm -hmm. home. If they got to wait four or five days, they may have it, may have done spread it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, right. That's a good point. And so we I'd also. Like to re 
go ahead. That's a really good point. And so um, anytime, and so the, the state allows us, because the long-term care facility employees are high priority, just for those reasons, because they're in close proximity to high-risk folks, we want to test them um, and we inform them and educate them about using precautions. And so Executive Order 131 put in some um, shalls for, lo for long-term care facilities that included that staff must um, wear um, proper PPE when interacting with um, all residents for that very reason. And so um, hopefully um, our, the staff that we tested will come back negative. Um, but if, if someone does come back positive, then we can quickly identify them and isolate them um, and then figure out any other close contacts that, that they've had. Very good. And I, I just want to reiterate what Tim said. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank your team. Y'all have done a fantastic job. Evidently, our numbers are low, which is a great thing. And uh, just appreciate everything you do. And also, Amy, I want to mention we skipped our clerk. Yeah, I so know. So when you come back, <laughs> we don't want to that. forget our clerk. <laughs> we're going to come back and we're going to do the proclamation about the municipal clerk's week after uh, we finish with this item. Thank you for okay. it up. All right. Very You're good. You're right. <laughs> My bad. Thank Sorry. you, Mr. Boswell. All right, anybody else? I do have one other question. We got an email. I'm not sure if y'all all got it, if I just got it, about a, a company wanting to have information about their employees who were, uh, were te might have tested positive, and then the, the Human Resources Department was supposedly trying to do contact tracing and I wasn't aware that private organizations were doing contract contact tracing um, I'm not familiar with the email but I can tell you in general um, it's usually not an HR department that would do it so if we found a case um, and they had been at work so at a workplace uh, we asked them where they work um, who their supervisor is um, and then we contact but we ask them who they've been in contact with during work um, and so we still do the contact tracing we might use folks at the um, work site to help locate individuals because not everybody has everybody's phone number or you know right so we might w partner with um, occupational health or human resources to find those folks um, who might have been exposed <coughs> but typically it's not going to be the workplaces HR department that um, does the contact tracing that, that was what I was thinking uh, apparently the company is not in Alamance County they said the employee oh. There are a number of employees apparently from Alamance County that work there, and they were saying that the Human Resources Department was doing that. But it's an out of out of county mm -hmm. area, and I didn't go into it, try to dig down into the weeds and figure yeah. out what company or where. But if it's a large scale outbreak in a work site, um, local public health, and right. and if it's large enough, state public health would likely be working with the work site, and so there might be functions um, that they're helping with. Okay, that's Thank about you. all I can provide. I have one little question about contact tracing, um, and I haven't seen this as a recommendation, but I've often wondered if it wouldn't be smart for us all to keep a record of where we've been and who we've been around, and so that if we do test positive mm -hmm. for the virus, then we could hand that over to the public health uh, person who shows up to do our contact tracing, and that might help make it easier to identify if we have like a store, like if a lot right. of people have visited a store during the same period of time and then gotten sick. Um, but I haven't seen that to be an official recommendation, like wearing re masks is not mm -hmm. required, but it's a recommendation. And I understand that some people are working on digital tracking apps to do right. that for us through our phones, which people have a lot of concerns yeah. about their privacy, legitimately so, with that. But would it be something that um, could be sort of a, a positive thing that a person can do to help Absolutely. public health is to keep a personal record mm -hmm. so that they can furnish that if needed? Absolutely. Um, you know, for the most part, we, we're banking on people with their own his, you know, recalling their own history of who they've been around. But we absolutely if folks want to keep track of that we that would be very helpful particularly as cases increase 
Um, and as restrictions are lifted, you're likely to be more in contact and more interactions. So absolutely, we would not discourage you from doing that. Uh, but you're right, I've not seen anything um, nationally or statewide that says to do that. Um, but you could most certainly do that. Um, and you're right, there are some digital, digital apps that um, folks are looking at as well that would track it. Um, and there are indeed some concerns from folks about the privacy and, and how mm -hmm. that information gets shared. Um, but absolutely, that we could encourage people to do that. Um, particularly as, like I said, as restrictions get lifted, um, which we, you know, over time they will, and um, you're more likely to be interacting with more folks. So, absolutely. Yeah, I was thinking that if, you know, with a digital app, I can interest, I wouldn't want my, I don't like my whereabouts being tracked, so I'm yeah. one of those that resists texting people when I get <laughs> places that I'm supposed to go so they know that I got there safely. Um, I'm kind of extreme on the not wanting to be tracked spectrum um and i can certainly understand you know once you turn it on how do you turn it off and once you get you know do we really trust these data companies yeah. that they're only going to give the information to the public health department and that it's not going to be used for some kind of other purpose right. that um might infringe on our personal liberty so i completely understand people resisting that but if we wrote it down ourselves on a piece of paper kept mm -hmm. a little paper journal and then just handed it, you know, over mm -hmm. to the public health department that's local. Yeah. Then that seems like to me just a, a way to be useful and helpful and help people do their jobs a little bit. Absolutely, <laughs> our contact tracing nurses would absolutely appreciate that because um, everybody's a little bit different on their their um, their abilities to be a good historian. Um, so absolutely, we would not discourage that at all. And there are a lot of concerns about the, num the number of people who are going to big box stores and whether or not yeah. that is a hotbed for transmission of the virus. And that would be a way to really help determine that. Mm -hmm. If um, you had 50 people pop up with the virus in the last 10 days, they had all been to you right. know, a certain store at a certain period of time within a right. six hour window. That would be very interesting, I'm mm -hmm. sure, to yes. the public health department. Yes, it would be. It would, that would be a very good tool for surveillance. So. Or maybe monitoring. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right, anybody else have any questions? If not, thank you. Well, I would like to ask her to comment on, it's obvious we're, we're starting to ease up. Uh, I think Amy mentioned the big box stores. I think the governor said uh, the malls were going to open Friday. Is that, is that not correct? I don't, I don't know. I think he's actually said that was going to happen yet. I think he's supposed to announce that today, maybe. They're having a conference today at 1130, mm -hmm. I saw. So that's possibly uh, the phase one implementation. Right. I hope that they'll shed some light on that. I know down at the beach, they uh, opened the hotels on what day was that? May 1st. And uh, I called down there and I said, are you opening? Yes. But the pools are closed. The restaurants are closed. <laughs> Starbucks is closed. I said, well, shoot, I could sleep here. And uh, she laughed and she said, well, and I knew her. She said, well, I said, you really get a kick out of this. We're not going to accept any reservations from anybody from New York. New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey. Now that that's a policy, Myrtle Beach, and uh, but I think in two weeks they're going to go full blown, from what I'm hearing. But uh, now we got to be prepared for that. But anyway, thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you yes, so thank much. You. All right, and I am not having my finest morning. Uh, I have skipped two things on the agenda, the public speakers, and then I also, after we did the Motorcycle Safety Awareness Month, I neglected to do uh, the proclamation for the 51st Municipal Clerks Week. That was my fault. Um, usually I skip breakfast before commissioner meetings, and I think it makes me sharper today. I have a honey chicken biscuit fog <laughs> over my brain, so I'm going to blame it on the biscuit. Um, Tori, would you mind please reading the proclamation, or am I supposed to read it? I'm supposed to read it. Okay. All right. So we have a proclamation concerning the 50th anniversary of Municipal Clerks Week, May 3rd through 9th, 2020. 
Whereas the office of the clerk, a time-honored and vital part of local government, exists throughout the world, and whereas the office of the clerk is the oldest among public servants, and whereas the office of the clerk provides the professional link between the citizens, the local governing bodies, and agencies of government at other levels, and whereas clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and impartiality, rendering equal service to all, whereas the clerk serves as the information center on functions of local government and the community, whereas clerks continually strive to improve the administration of the affairs of the office of clerk through participation in education programs, seminars, workshops, and the annual meetings of their state, provincial, county, and international professional organizations, whereas it is most appropriate that we recognize the accomplishments of the Office of the Municipal Clerk. Now, therefore, I, Amy Scott Gailey, Chair of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, and on behalf of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners, do recognize the week of May 3rd through 9th, 2020, as Municipal Clerks Week and further extend appreciation to our county clerk, Tori Frank, and to all the other municipal clerks serving their municipalities in Alamance County for the vital services they perform and their exemplary dedication to the communities they represent, dated this fourth day of May, 2020. So thank you, Tori, very Good much point. for all that you do for us. And um, amen to that. People, she works so hard. <coughs> People don't know how hard Tory works, and um, he inserted the face of our office. So thank you, Tory. I want to thank you for all you've done for me in the past. You've been a great asset to our board, without a doubt. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair Gailey. I just wanted to be full disclosure. We had a sound issue from uh, all the way up until the beginning of Stacy's. So uh, we have a recording device. Of course, it'll be published on the web like normally, but we're trying to do this live in the first about 10 minutes where there was no sound. So I'm just letting people know that at our website, you can pull up that first part of the, uh, the agenda, and we apologize for that. Maybe we should have a chicken biscuit eat or something. <laughs> <laughs> sort of a choppy meeting today. Everybody has a rough day sometimes. so. Thank you, everyone, for your patience and for the public. I'm sorry about that uh, complication with the sound. But so they can see it, they can go this back. This should be up probably tomorrow. It'll probably be able to publish it anyway. But you know, now that we're doing it live and publishing it, after we make sure it's working correctly. OK, thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda, I think, is the Alamance Community College budget presentation. Is that right? Did I miss anything? <laughs> Y'all got to jump in and help me out here. So we have uh, Dr. Algie Gay Wood, I believe, is on the phone. Dr. Gay Wood, are you there? That's correct. I am here. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And present with us today, we have Matt Banco and Scott Queen, also from Alamance Community mm -hmm. College. So uh, welcome, and we're happy to hear from you. Good to be here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Madam Chair and members of the commission. Also, I want to thank you for your support of the college and for the opportunity to present the 2021 county budget request in the amount of $4,109,285. Thank you for allowing me to participate uh, by telephone also. As has been introduced, um, we have Scott Clean and Matt Banco. Scott will talk give a brief update of the bond projects and Matt Banco will speak directly to our finances and I would like to give you some quick highlights and if you will move to slide two by the way the page numbers are in the upper right hand corner of pages the college continues in serving the people we've had a very successful year our enrollment has grown by 7.33%, which is outstanding. Wow. And our curriculum offerings has grown to 45 programs. And we continue to provide a nice complement of workforce development and continuing education programs. And our corporate education program provided training, training to 80 companies. Slide three, please, Scott. Our university transfer agreements have grown to give students expanded opportunity. 
and as depicted, the latest transfer agreement signing ceremony with UNC Wilmington's Chancellor Jose Sartorelli. Through this agreement, ACC students may be co-admitted to UNCW and ACC at the same time. Slide four, please. The college has been active in our local mobilization in response to COVID-19. And we donated through the county emergency management, personal protective equipment such as gloves, N95 masks and gowns. Not to mention that we have thousands of ACC graduates on the front lines delivering healthcare services every day. In fact, one of our nursing graduates Angela Robbins, who works at Alamance Regional Hospital, was featured on Fox 8 News for COVID-19 patient care that she provided. Next slide, please. That would be slide five. We planned for a lot of things, but we did not plan for a pandemic. And it goes without saying that we find ourselves in uncharted waters, undertaking unprecedented actions chiefly delivering instruction almost entirely online. In late February, we activated our emergency operations plan. And that provided a structure and a process to monitor and mitigate this unique situation. We are coordinating closely with the Alamance County Departments of Health, Emergency Management, the CDC, and the North Carolina Community College System Office. As the number of COVID-19 cases mounted, we made the decision to extend spring break by one week. And that gave us time to transition almost all of the instruction online. So when spring semester resumed on the 23rd of March, our instructors and students, for the most part, were working from home. I say for the most part, there is an exception some of our health and safety classes have been deemed mission critical by the state of North Carolina, such as nursing, basic law enforcement, and EMT. So those classes continue to meet face-to-face. -face. Of course, we employ all of the COVID-19 protocols. Speaking of protocols, appropriate protocols were in place for the entire college, and chief among them are physical and social distancing, including staggering, uh, staggered scheduling, enhanced cleaning and disinfecting, issuing masks and gloves to those working on site. And we're constantly communicating with our students, not only about their studies, but about practicing good hygiene and social distancing. We planned off our summer term, which begins May 18, primary online as well. All of this has not been without challenges for both the students and instructors alike, but they've received an A grade in my book. I, I commend them for doing a great job in making the transition to online and making it so quickly. Slide, uh, slide six, please. Some good news. The college is receiving almost $2.4 million in federal stimulus funding and that's through the Coronavirus Relief Act, better known as CARES Act. One half of that funding will be used for student emergency aid. The other half is to offset the cost that we are incurring as a direct result of the pandemic. We're also planning for more normal operations for fall 2020, if that is possible. If it is not possible, we will continue to offer as many courses as we can online and so that we can continue our operation because the college is going to be in higher demand now with all of the unemployment than it has seen in decades, in over a decade. So we're, we're playing a major role, a critical role. At this time, I would ask Scott Queen to give a brief update on the bond construction. And Matt, you may follow Scott and we'll take questions following the completion of this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Bigwood. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning. I have to reminisce that the last time I presented formally before you was about six years ago um, when Dr. Gatewood made the ask to fund the Advanced Applied Technology Center, which is now um, very successfully into its third year of operations. 
So I hope that in about six years from now, we'll be coming back to you and reporting on um, how well some of these new facilities are, are going. And I suspect if I know Dr. Gatewood, he will probably be the one here in six years doing that, probably <laughs> presenting on the college's next master plan. Uh, so I can You're run correct, through this Scott. very quickly um, in a, probably two minutes. So just as a recap of the, the current projects, the Biotechnology Center of Excellence and the Associated Parking, uh, that's a $17.56 million project. The Student Services Center, $6.2 million. Public Safety Training Center, which will be um, constructed off-site for $10.4 million. The modernization of instructional space and technology in our five-star child care center at $4.4 million. And East and West satellite locations off-site at $500,000 each. Uh, the Biotechnology Center of Excellence, just to give you a quick update, is on schedule. Uh, the architectural design firm for that project is Clark Nexon, and the Chrisman Group uh, are the construction managers at risk. So thankfully, COVID-19 has not slowed momentum uh, really in any of these projects. We continue to meet virtually weekly. In fact, we have a meeting scheduled tomorrow for all of these projects. We have community stakeholder groups comprised of stakeholders internal to the college as well as external. Uh, so we're meeting with those groups regularly, um, again, keeping things on schedule. Right now, we're in the details in terms of designing what the classrooms and lab spaces will look like in the student commons areas and so forth, and scheduled to begin construction in late spring of 2021. The Public Safety Training Center, we hope to be in the design phase uh, relatively quickly. Uh, Mosley Architects was selected as the architectural firm, and Samet Corporation is the construction manager at risk. And as you are probably aware, we are still negotiating a lease with Mark Marietta uh, Materials Incorporated, and once that is complete, uh, hopefully the, the design phase of that project will commence. The Student Services Center, uh, our Buildings and Grounds Committee of the Board of Trustees is scheduled to virtually interview uh, design firms for this project tomorrow uh, and take a recommendation to the full board um, this month, next Monday evening. This project is scheduled to begin construction in the fall of 2021. I believe um, I'll turn it over now to Matt Banco. Uh, who will walk you through the actual county budget request. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. This slide here speaks to what it is the appropriation goes to, and that's 455,000 square feet of uh, internal space. Basically, when you talk about the county appropriation, you're talking about outside the walls and janitorial services inside uh, and, and uh, maintenance services inside. 140 acres, that includes the uh, Carrington Scott Center, the, uh, the Dillingham Center, and now the Covington Education Center right outside Mevin. So what it, it uh, funds about 50 positions that we have, uh, which is, includes grounds, public safety, and um, janitorial and maintenance positions. Next slide. So this year's uh, request is um, Actually, a little bit less than last year's appropriation by two hundred twenty-five thousand. Uh, our, we believe this is a, a conservative request of of an increase of about one hundred sixty-four thousand um, dollars, as well as a, a capital request of four hundred eighty thousand, which in total um, comes to four point one million, which is less than last year's appropriation of about four point three million. And here's a summary of um, how we intend to use the, the increases. Um, on the operating side, uh, 164, almost 165,000 increases as part of a three-year plan. We presented this back in um, actually last April. So this is year two of that three-year plan. Uh, most of that is going to maintenance, um, utilities as well. Um, with 20,000 to salary and benefits. Um, on the, the capital side, uh, there are, we received a county or a state bond um, amount of about six million. And so we need to 
to put folks, students in temporary spaces um, in, in, um, during the next year so as we backfill our, our uh, main campus at the Carrington Scott Center, or campus. Um, we always want to have roof repairs in there to keep in front of uh, any problems that would come if we do not stay on top of roof repairs. And then there's other system up upgrades um, for 108,000. Next slide. So um, currently we're funded about $798 per um, full-time enrollment uh, student. Um, a big project this year that we are just finishing up is our performance contracting. which is, we, we had $2.4 million of capital uh, improvements that we'll pay for over, a, over 15 years. Um, and we'll continue to identify grant opportunities for capital projects. Um, we're, we're sitting on, we just received notice of a, a Canon grant for $200,000 that will help with our, um, our HVAC um, upgrade. And, um, public safety we've received and are about to receive another um, state public safety grant. I think that's pretty much a wrap of my presentation. Next slide. This return on investment just speaks to the fact that, uh, do you want to speak to this, uh, Dr. Gatewood? Matt, you're doing so well. Please <laughs> continue. Well, thank you. Really, what the, what the goal is, is to, uh, lower the cost of social services and uh, the cost of law enforcement and, and increase the tax base to keep people working, especially in this time that we're, we're looking towards a recession. We want to um, get people back into employment situations with either um, something that they can accomplish in, in continuing education or maybe a two-year degree to get people back in the workforce, um, and which really increases the quality of life for all. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, uh, Dr. Queen. Madam Chair, this concludes our uh, presentation. Great. We'll take any questions you may have. Okay. Um, uh, Mr. Boswell, do you have any questions? Uh, no, just a couple comments. Okay, go ahead. It's been a real pleasure being on the board down there in the community college. It's always looking forward, not trying to catch up, but looking forward and putting putting uh, the needs of our county up front. And during this pandemic thing, I'm just thinking about this center of excellence that the voters voted on the bond project. Uh, that's going to be the future of our county. I mean, as, as we're looking to these testing labs and all that across the country, in fact, one of them, LabCorp, was noted uh, as one of the top testing agencies in this pandemic thing. And I just see the future of our county lies within the community college because that's where people can get trained to work and find out these solutions, find out where the, where these vac what these vaccines need to be. And, and it's just exciting to be on that board. Um, one, of, one of the graphs that I'm looking at was uh, the funds per student there at Alamance Community College is right at the bottom of the list under many others, uh, Vance, Granville, Davidson, and a lot of the other counties. So I think that the college has done a fantastic job spending the money that we provide to them. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Well, I would say this, I'm on the campus of David Davidson Community College quite often, Randolph Community College quite often, and our situation here puts theirs uh, pretty much on another level uh, as far as what it looks like, how, and I don't mean that negative. I mean, we, we have something to be proud of here. And thank you, Dr. Gatewood. Thank you very much, Mr. Sutton. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Boswell, as well. Yes, Mr. Lashley? I think ACC has done a good job. We're proud of what you do. 
and uh, because we know that that's what helps prepare people for good jobs. I came out of that environment, and it works. Thank you, Mr. Lashley. And please know that we cannot do this without the support of the county commissioners. And we are very grateful. And the people of this county, I'm sure, are grateful as well. Thank you. Well, I'm just looking at the same, uh, same chart that Eddie was looking at. And uh, I look over here and see that some of the other schools in our area cost their citizens twice what our county, county citizens are paying to support ACC. So uh, I think we're getting some bang for our buck and a good return as well. So we appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you again. Um, Dr. Gaywood, I just had a little question about um, how, how do y'all make the decision about how you're going to operate with the, um, with the virus, if, like if there's a second wave this fall, um, I know that the public school system, K through 12, they were under the governor's order to close. Um, I don't recall that being announced statewide for community colleges. I guess when they impose a requirement of 10 people or less to gather, that that in itself curtails the way that you're able to operate. But I'm curious to know, in the absence of a 10 person or less gathering um, mandate, are y'all, do you make those operations decisions with your board of trustees or is there a community college association? Are y'all tied in with other community colleges and held to the same kind of operating rules in a pandemic? How is that decision made? Um, Madam Chair, that decision is made by the administration and to make that a decision such as that there is coordination unbelievable coordination with the state department of community colleges with the emergency management with the alamance county health department the alamance county health department and our public safety uh, director are in close communication and we have a COVID 19 a response team on campus made up of, of a uh, made up of administrators we to begin we met daily now we're meeting weekly the community college presidents meet at least weekly on COVID-19 and the community colleges also has a COVID-19 response team which is made up of six regional presidents Fortunately, I am one of those regional presidents uh, who served on that team. So it is a, it's a massive undertaking and we consider so many variables. Now, with all of that said, in offering our classes in person, we are employing COVID-19 protocol. With having our staff, a limited number of our staff working in, on the on-site, we are implementing COVID-19 protocols, staggered scheduling, and also ensuring that our people are wearing the protective um, equipment to the best of our ability. We haven't gotten to where it's forced, but we've made those supplies available and the staff who are on campus have actually I've been very good about um, acquiring the supplies from us to use in the workplace. There are a lot of steps involved in this. It's like building the airplane in flight and then there's a landing strip just ahead and we have to be ready. So we're constantly preparing. It, in terms of what we do in the fall, we're still planning, we're still working on that and looking at all the various alternatives. I know that the state Department of Community College has an interest because of workforce need of offering more face-to-face -face, uh, classes, if at all possible. So we're looking at all of those measures. Great, that's very useful and helpful. I appreciate that. So there's not really a thank you. There's not really a Raleigh-centered statewide decision maker that's in, you know 
dictate or d telling you what to do. It's really the people who are doing the job working together and cooperating and coming to the decision that uh, fits the community the best. That's what I'm hearing. That is, that is correct. Albeit Raleigh provides some excellent guidance. It's left up to colleges to follow that guidance. And we have to this point, and we will continue to follow the guidance of the state. Um, but it is a local decision as to whether or not we operate, how we operate, et cetera. Thank you. That's, that's very interesting. Anybody else have any questions based on something that they've heard from another commissioner? If not, okay. Thank you, gentlemen, very, very much. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Hollywood. Thank you. Okay. As far as I can tell, the next item on our agenda is uh, consideration of approval of financing the a capital plan financing, financing a bid. No, a financing bid. Um, is that right? Is that the next thing on our agenda? Am I reading that properly? <laughs> um, and so, Susan Evans. So let's go over who's in the room now because we've had some people come and go. So we still have the same commissioners, Commissioner Carter, myself, Commissioner Lashley, Tori Frank, Clyde Albright, Brian Haygood, Susan Evans, and Bruce Walker. So those are the people who are present in the meeting room now. So, Susan, are you going to present this, or is Brian? Uh, Chair Daly, if I could speak to this item for just a moment before Susan gets started. She's going to give details about it, but I wanted to take <clears> just a moment and speak to it. Is that, is that okay? Of course. Um, commissioners, if you'll remember, we've been working on a capital plan for county government ever since uh, last year. We adopted a county plan for the uh, various facilities for uh, the ones the county maintains. And in that capital plan, there was capacity to borrow $5 million this fiscal year to do a multitude of roof repair projects, HVAC projects, elevator projects, uh, all kinds of different projects. We've been planning to do this work. In fact, we came to the commissioners and much like the schools and the college uh, have done, they got a reimbursement resolution. So the county fronted itself uh, $5 million and started bidding out projects. In fact, we've done a number of projects already. And what we're coming to you today to do uh, I've, what I've done is said we need to curtail some of these projects, right? We had $5 million worth of projects that we wanted to do, and we have the capacity in our capital plan to pay debt on $5 million. But at this point, we have done close to $2 million uh, worth of these projects. And I've asked that we hold off on the other $3 million until we kind of see where we're going next fiscal year. We have the ability to do that. But what Susan's going to present to you uh, this morning is I'm, I'm recommending that we do borrow this $2.2 million. If we do not, we will use our unassigned fund balance to pay for it because the work has pretty much been done as we had planned originally. So uh, if we borrow these funds, uh, our fund balance will, uh, our unassigned fund balance will be $5 million to the better by the end of this fiscal year because we'll release $5 million worth of funds that were tied up in the reimbursement resolution, right? We, we said... $5 million of our unassigned fund balance is planned to be used this fiscal year to do this work. We've only done about $2 million worth of it. Right. This loan will allow us to pay ourselves back, and because we're not going to go forward right now with the other $3 million, our fund balance for fiscal year 1920 will grow in a good way $5 million. I, I would urge the board to consider this action. I think it puts uh, some money back in our unassigned fund balance account puts us in a little bit better position going into next fiscal year. So uh, the items that Susan are bringing uh, do take your approval. And if you agree with that philosophy, then you'll you'll consider what she's bringing and approving. And I'm, I'll certainly try to answer any other questions. But at this point, Susan. May I ask a question before she proceeds? Yes. I don't know. Has, did, have you listed in our agenda, and if you have, I apologize, our packet, uh, the projects that you're putting on hold? Uh, the, main, the main project that we're putting on hold is the uh, repair work to the HVAC system at the Human Service Center on Graham Hopedale Road. That project alone is a little over $2 million. So uh, I know that one is on hold. I'm not sure that any of the other ones are in your packet. I can get you a list of those, but the main one, uh, was the HSC uh, HVAC work 
and it does need to be done uh, as all of them do. They're all uh, either roof projects or elevators or something that's uh, important to critical buildings. Uh, and so that one will need to be considered at some point. And as we go through next fiscal year, we may determine that uh, we've opened back up and, and it's feasible to do. When we, and you said that social services, right? That's correct. Okay, when we took that hospital and converted it over to that, uh, I think we spent about $5 million, if I'm not mistaken, on, on getting that online for that, for that um, service. And was any H, uh, uh, H, what do you call it, HV? I never call it, I call it air conditioning. <laughs> he, uh, was any work done then with that money on that building? in that arena so i believe that was around the mid 90s perhaps maybe 95 96 i'm not 100 percent sure of that that's, uh, that's correct and I, I there was funding spent to do renovation work at the old hospital it had to be done to just con convert it over to office space i am sure there was some level of hvac work done at that time uh, i know that uh, you know at this point the system is in uh disrepair needs to be uh, replaced. And that bill has been through many changes since 96. Folks have, uh, they have really packed in over there as health and DSS have grown. Uh, they, they've really taken uh, a lot of the space that wasn't in the original plan to be used for offices and have now made it into offices. So um, I think it would be, it's still a worthwhile investment. I, I just, I feel like it would be wise to wait until we get further into next fiscal year before we commit to that. Well, I'm just curious about the money that was spent then for that particular reason. If you could do a little research on that, I'd appreciate it. Certainly. Not saying it's not warranted. I just would like to see that. We will do that. Good morning, commissioners. Um, before you this morning is uh, the responses that we received from the requested proposals in conjunction with working with our financial advisor, Davenport and company. The county issued a RFP to be able to place the loan for this amount of $2.2 million. We received eight responses that were submitted, and of those eight responses, we would bring before you this morning to recommend, it, to recommend that that be given to Capital One Finance. Um, we would be looking at a 15-year term, and part of the loan would be taxable, and part of it would be tax exempt and those interest rates would be at 2.09%, and then for the tax-exempt tax interest rate of 2.53%. We would have it set up to where there would be one principal payment and two interest payments throughout the life of that loan. Are there any questions concerning those terms? This Capital One, uh, where are they based out of? Um, the contact information that I was given, Commissioner Sutton, is New York. Um, in dealing with mm -hmm. Davenport, there are multiple, they do many loans here in North Carolina. The LGC is familiar with them as well as um, Brandon Lofton, who is our bond counsel. He's familiar with them as well. Okay, well, I would just say on a consumer basis, I don't think the reputation's that hot, but uh, I'll leave you there. <laughs> Understood. Well, I always like dealing with somebody local, too, and I, First Bank's a local bank, but that is a, there's about a 20, what is about $24,000 difference in the overall cost of borrowing the funds from one to the other. I'll make the motion. We approve. I'll second it. So we have a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Carter to approve Capital One is the bank for this uh, financing project. Is there any discussion? I'll have to admit too, I think it's a prudent way for us to address this at this time with the issues we're dealing with revenue wise to hold off on the additional work and then this puts money back in our mm -hmm fund balance so that we prepare to go into what we might be dealing with next year. Right. I agree with Mr. Carter on that. Yeah, I do too. 
Okay, we have a motion and a second. If there's no more discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries to approve Capital One as the bank for this financing project. Okay. Next, we have a request to set a public hearing. Yes, ma'am. What we would ask you now is to consider the resolution before you that would set a public hearing for this financing project um, for May 18th at 7 p.m. That would give our citizens the time to speak upon this, and then from there we would present the final financing contract that would be approved at that meeting as well. Second. Uh, Mr. Lashley has made a motion to set the public hearing and Mr. Carter has seconded it. Um, I have a couple of questions and so, well, Mr. Boswell, do you have any questions? Well, I, I'm just trying to think through the logistics of how, how are we going to do this? Uh, yeah, that was one of Hearing my questions, and too. <laughs> and Mr. Sutton, do you have any questions about the public hearing other than questions about uh, logistics and how it's going to work? No. Okay, so uh, Mr. Albright, uh, to have a public hearing during the time of COVID, how are we going to do that? Well, you have uh, the opportunity for people to submit their comments as long as you can produce the... Uh, enough information for them to review. I think you can do it through, as we're doing this meeting, people can submit their comments, people can telephone in, um, they can still have access. So we'll have, like, um, for the public to be reminded, with the notice for this meeting is instructions on how you can submit your comments online to the clerk, or you can um, call the clerk and ask for us to call you during the meeting. So if you want to make a public comment, either for a regular agenda item or for um, this public hearing, you just call and ask ahead of time, and then we'll call you and put you on the speaker so we can hear your comment. Um, Mr. Albright, is there a requirement that people be able to call in during the meeting itself? Like we have a phone line set up and people call? No, we, we, the board has to maintain some control over the meeting. I think it's best to just have the clerk call them at the appropriate time. That way you don't have several people calling and put on hold. Okay. Right. I do have a question too. The, it seems like I saw there was a trigger date in here on the commitment on the response. I can't remember whether I saw that or not, but uh, reading through it. So what we would do is we would allow um, the outcome of this meeting to let Capital One know that the board has approved them to be awarded the bid. And so we would ask them to move forward with those contracts if that was what the requirement that we're meeting. Okay, so that would comply with the trigger date for commitments on rates is what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Public hearing. I mean, well, we may be released from the, who knows, we may be released in before the end of May from having to have 10 people in a meeting or less. That's true. Um, probably into June, hopefully. Would it be prudent then to extend that public hearing date into the first of the first meeting in June and give us time to have a possibly a public, a, a true public hearing on the process. Certainly do that if that's the board's wish. Um, I just got Mr. the contracts Paul. Friday, so it'll take yeah. some time to review them and make changes if necessary. I think one thing I would say is if, if it's possible to do, to take this action if the board approves after the public hearing, then it does help us from an audit perspective because mm -hmm. this, this action needs to be taken this fiscal year for sure so we can right. we can see the benefit of regaining the unassigned fund balance because that right. will be shown in our audit and it has to happen in the uh, well, and I'd also um, like to point out that after this meeting, we'll be actually submitting an application to the LGC. So we would also have to have the LGC's uh, approval. And for us to be able to close on the loan in this fiscal year, they'll need to do at, that at their first June meeting. So there's some time pressure. Yes, yes ma'am. 
Okay. But I think we can set it up in such a way that the public gets ample opportunity to, to comment to the, to the commissioners in a way that meets the um, compliance uh, requirements too. Yeah. And Mr. Boswell, does that answer your concerns? Yes, it does, and I, I'm okay with that. I for what we're thinking because just even if we get into what phase two of our coming back, we we still gonna be down to ten people. So yeah. I, I don't know. I'm I'm fine with that. Okay, so we had a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Carter to um, set the public hearing. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So we've approved the public hearing for May 18th at 7 p.m. on that capital plan financing. Um, Madam Chair, would you please read the bold print on the resolution into the record? I would be happy to. Thank you. Resolution calling a public hearing on whether the Board of Commissioners for the County of Alamance, North Carolina, should approve a proposed installment financing to finance a portion of the cost of various projects. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, now we have a presentation about approval of a bid award for building construction. Thank you. Uh, if the commissioners will recall, we have uh, a, a project in the works, the Petrie Building. This is uh, building that was graciously has been funded by a donation from Mr. Ron Petrie, uh, $3.2 million uh, donation from Mr. Petrie to construct a new county building that the uh, goal would be to house Friendship Adult Day Service, Open Door Clinic, and a uh, function of the Department of Social Services. The function would be to give a place for families to uh, come and uh, uh, interact with kids in a controlled manner. Uh, so we have uh, Mr. Perry Peterson with us here today. Very glad to have him. He represents Peterson Gordon Architect Firm, and that's the firm that's helping us design and uh, oversee this project. So um, at this point, I'll be happy to turn it over to Perry. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for being here today. Sure. sure. Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning. <clears throat> Did want to share with you the results of what we've been doing on the project. Uh, April 15th, we took bids. And we had 10 contractors submit bids, which in construction land is a lot of bids. Yep. We were able to have six of them attend in this room to witness the bidding, and then the remainder were on Facebook Live. So it might have been the first Facebook Live bidding in North Carolina, and I, I told them I hoped it'd be the last, but <laughs> that remains to be seen. Uh, with the 10 bids, though, our low bidder was Bar Construction out of Greensboro. And their bid was $2.427 million, which is roughly $375,000 under budget. So we had a really good outcome, and we were very pleased with that. And <clears throat> Bar Construction is a company I've worked with over 25 years now, so I know they will do a terrific job on the building, so I have no reservation about saying that. Our target being at the 2.8 million was uh, getting to this overall project cost of 3.2 million. Well, with our bid, our new overall construction cost comes in roughly at 2.875 million, which is trying to put every cost we can think of into that to make sure that we have enough money. We've got some allowances, and I believe in your information, you, you have a listing of all those things. Uh, some have, to do with construction contingencies, others with uh, Burlington has an impact fee that we have not received yet. We budgeted enough money to make sure we can pay for all of those things. Having said all that, that leaves probably close to a half a million dollars for the diversion center renovations, which is kind of the second piece of this project. And we were really surprised to have that much money available as the economy was going, we didn't think we we're gonna have any money. So, so this is terrific. So our plan is essentially to hopefully award the contract today, get construction going in <coughs> June on the actual Ann Petrie Ivy building. And then about sometime next month, we'll actually start on the work on the renovations to the diversion center. We've got to bid that, have that kind of in place. When everybody moves out of there, we 
crank right up and start into the renovations there. So that's how the schedule works on that. But that's pretty much pretty easy report, good things to report. So I'll take any questions you like at this time. I just think it's fabulous that we have somebody donating money for a new facility and uh, and then we can bring it in under call under our projected budget too. That's 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 a really good job. I appreciate that. Indeed, and I think uh, I would say the, the funds that can be applied to the diversion center, we still have our, uh, if, if the commissioners will remember, Cardinal Innovations uh, gave us a grant of $1.2 million that right. we're still holding. So we, we could put all that together to uh, uh, renovate the building on Martin Street uh, and make that the new diversion center. So it's good news. And we're, we're very excited about it. And I think Friendship Adult Day and Open Door Clinic are also very excited about, uh, mm -hmm. about the, the new building too. So if, if anybody cares to make a motion, if he could include in his motion giving Mr. Haygood authority to sign the contract as well as accepting the bid, if anybody wants to make a motion. Motion to approve. Mr. Carter has made a motion to accept the bid and give Brian Haygood authority to sign the contract. Yes. I'll second that. And Mr. Lashley has seconded it. Is there any discussion? I, I also would like to thank Mr. Petrie for his donation to our county and for investing in a county that he, he's enjoyed living in, I'm assuming, and thank him personally for his uh, donation here. Absolutely. Agree 100%. Is there any more discussion? If not, we have a motion by Mr. Carter and a second by Mr. Lashley. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? So the motion to accept the bid and give Brian Haygood authority to sign the contract carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks. Thank you. All right. It looks like our next item is to consider a resolution extending occupancy tax deadlines. <coughs> Susan Evans. Commissioners, before you this morning is a resolution which would provide a waiver of late fees to our hotels in Alamance County. They collect occupancy tax and it's remitted by the 20th of the following month. And what this would allow is for hotels not to be um, charged a late fee if there is a delay in them being able to pay their occupancy tax. And that would extend from the month of April through uh, July 20th. And the resolution does give um, notice to the hotels that if occupancy tax for those months have not been received and processed by the county by July 20th, that we would go back and impose those, right. those fees. Motion to approve. Second. So we have a motion to approve the resolution by Mr. Carter and a second by Mr. Lashley. Is there any discussion? If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Aye. Uh, Anyone opposed? Thank, thank you. you. Okay, looks like we have a budget amendment. And here comes Tanya Cattle, our planning director, to present that budget amendment. And so I'm just going to go over who's in the room real quick because we've had some people switch in and out. We still have uh, Bruce Walker, Steve Carter, myself, Mr. Lashley, Tori Frank, Claude Albright, Brian Haygood, and Susan Evans, and Tanya, now Tanya Cattle, our planning director. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you all for having me this morning. What you have before you is the grant, and I'll take you back to December. We applied to the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality. They issued the Abenam Mobile Home Grant. The Alamance County has received that grant for multiple years. This year they did things a little bit differently, and they didn't kind of put a cap on us or look at what we've done in the past. So we got a good amount of money. We got $15,000 awarded to us. At this point, we um, are before you wanting to accept that and move forward with the project. Have we identified some uh, units to be? So we're still taking applications. We probably have a half dozen applications to review and just make sure ownership is correct and taxes are paid, that they're a good pick for this. Uh, we can only do single wides and double wides can't do modulars or triple wides or anything anybody that has something built onto it a deck or whatever they have to take care of that our contractor only takes the unit away 
So all those kind of things play into what homeowners can do or what their obligations are on top of what we can allow for. And are we a tier one, two, or three? I think we were a tier one, is that right? Or I think we're a tier two. Maybe tier two. I read through all this. Yes. Um, tier two, okay. Okay. I think it's a great opportunity to get some of these junkers going. Yes. yes, and we partner with the cities. So this is a project that's inclusive of all of elements County. The cities are a part of this, so anything they need done. And we've heard from a couple that they've got some really code enforcement cases that could help out with this. We cannot take anything that's in a mobile home park. We have had that concern, but the state won't pay for those. Only things on individual properties. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, Mr. Carter has made a motion. Um, and Mr. Lashley has seconded it. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you. All right, we did not have any public speakers uh, submit comments or requests to address the board on non-agenda related items. So there's no commissioner responses. Uh, Mr. Hager, do you have a county manager report? Uh, one thing I want to bring to the board's attention is uh, obviously we're working on the budget uh, for fiscal year 2021. We still have not seen the March revenue figures from uh, sales tax. Uh, we expect to get those any day. We have not seen those yet. But uh, as we've been preparing the budget, I have had discussion with Dr. Benson over the school system. And as you know, we're, our, our capital plan and the bond timeline calls for debt issuance in the spring, in March of 21. And uh, what I've asked the school system to do is uh, consider that we may not, through our capital plan, fund them at the $3.3 million level for PAYGO capital that our plan calls for. That the plan for the school system is built on property tax dollars, sales tax dollars, and lottery. So you know, we're still unsure exactly what's gonna happen to sales tax. Now, it's, it is fortunate that the commissioners will not be making a final decision to issue that debt until possibly January of 21. It will be some time, so we'll have time to watch what happens before the final decision is made. But in the interim, uh, I, I feel like it would be prudent for the school system to know that in order to make it even more possible to issue debt in March, it's, it's probably best for them not to be planning on $3.3 million in PAYGO this year. So I've let them know that. I think they had some bids that were out or they were preparing to put out that they may pull back in or delay. So I want to make sure the commissioners knew that uh, up front. But I feel like there's only a few things the commissioners can control. They can control the amount of PAYGO that the school system gets and can control when uh, debt is issued. We can't really control sales tax revenue coming in or how much lottery revenue actually comes in or what interest rates are. But it feels like this is a prudent thing to consider. You know. The, the, the capital plan is set up in such a way that the school system will get access to that $3.3 million in PAYGO if it comes in. You know, if we're gonna track it and watch it, but when we budget funds for them at the start of the fiscal year, we may budget less than 3.3 million. And uh, I think they needed to know that so that if they were working on projects, they could slow down. Just very, this is very similar to what we've done with our loan that we just talked about. Right. So, uh, there's no action or anything on that, but I wanted to be sure the commissioners <coughs> knew that I'd had that discussion with the superintendent. So. And that's that's all that I have. I've got to prove the call. I'd like to ask you a question, Brian, if you will. Certainly. If you will, give us a brief uh, <clears throat> budget timeline as far as uh, what we're going to do at the next meeting or the next meeting, or if you don't mind. So, uh, what I've indicated to the commissioners is June 1, I'll be bringing a manager's recommended budget. Uh, so we, we originally were planning to do that on May 18th at our next meeting, but I've, I've been hoping to see a little bit more insight into what our revenues might look like. And we're also watching what other folks are seeing around the state. So June 1, I'm planning to bring a recommended budget. And then I think there's been a discussion about the possibility of a work session before in June before the uh, June 18th meeting, which is when the commissioners could schedule uh, the public hearing for the budget. The commissioners can vote on the same night as the public hearing or not. That's that's up to the board. So I, what I would foresee is June 1, you get the recommended budget. Then you have, if the board wants to have a special session to talk about the budget, that could be done before June 18th. 
could have your uh, public hearing on June 18th and the board may or may not vote that evening. If the board doesn't vote on the June 18th uh, meeting, there would need to be another uh, uh, meeting uh, scheduled before June 30th. I think it's June 15th. No, 15th. June 18th is the Thursday. Yes, that's correct. Sorry. So yeah, I'm glad you raised that question, um, Mr. Sutton, because I hadn't talked about that with the other commissioners about the possibility of having a workshop on June the 8th, uh, an in-person workshop. Do y'all have any opinions or thoughts about that since this is a very unusual budget year to give us the opportunity to discuss the budget in advance of the public hearing um, to kind of uh, give each of us an opportunity to articulate our thoughts? What do y'all think about that? I think that's good. Oh, I don't think there's any question. Yeah, I agree. I think we do need to have a workshop sometime prior to voting. I agree. I think we do too. Yeah, yeah I think we all agree. Um, so we'll firm that up uh, whether or not y'all want to. Well, we, I guess we could talk about it now. Do you have a preference about whether we do that in the morning or the evening? Is June the 8th okay? That's the Monday between them. Is that all right? Or do you have a. What do y'all think? I like a morning meeting myself. But. Yeah, I'd like a morning. Morning would be okay. Yeah, I'm good with that. I got, uh, I stopped talking uh, when I heard somebody else. And I apologize. I don't think there's any question we got to have a work session. And, um, and I'm not doing it out of my living room either. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, um, we've got to get together somehow, some way. Yeah, Mr. Sutton and I had a conversation about that, and I agree that it's uh, for something of this importance that it'd be better to have us physically present. So that's five. And so if we have um, the county manager and the finance officer there, that's seven. And um, we'd have to do it live, do a streaming thing, because it's a public meeting, so we have to have the media allowed to have access to it. But I think that since we won't have um, presentations or uh, things of that nature and if we have a situation where we have a question about an individual item then we could request that person be you know that the staff be alerted department heads be alerted that the board is going to be having a budget work session at that time and um, to be on standby to come and answer a question in person if necessary or uh, Mr. Higgett, I guess, could call him on the phone and we could ask him on the phone, do things like that. Would that be acceptable to you all? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. All right. Well, sounds good. And thank you, Mr. Sutton. That was your idea to have that work session. And I think it was a good one. I think it's going to be a really positive step on having a, a strong budget this year that has been well thought out and um, thoroughly vetted. So. Great. Do we have any commissioner comments? I've got one, Chair Gailey. Okay. Um, I understand I missed biscuits, and you were blaming that for the lack of <laughs> catching things on the uh, agenda today. Yeah. But I also understand it's a couple birthdays this week, too. So, um, <laughs> happy birthday to you and Brian both. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate Happy birthday, that. Indeed. That's nice. Kind of you to think about. I, I have one more comment. Okay. I'd like to ask our county attorney to respond to the state of emergency ordinance that I assume is still in place in our county. Is that correct? Well, um, I think it needs to be renewed maybe today. I think tomorrow. I'll have it to look. It expires today. Yes. It expires every five days. Yes. What What is your question? Well, if that's the case, uh, and we're uh, clear, we're clearly headed towards an easing of restrictions. That's correct. Unless there's a bomb drop today. And uh, what do you feel is the need for a an emergency ordinance declaration, in consideration of that possible scenario? Uh, from the governor's office, and how many counties do we know of that's uh, out of 100 that's got a state of an emergency ordinance out there? Do you know? I don't know the exact number. I think it's about 93. 
Um, that many. The reason that we do it is to emphasize the need for social distancing and limit gatherings to 10 or less. I think because, it also mm -hmm. has to do with reimbursement by FEMA for expenses incurred because the emergency during the state of emergency. I think that that's a big part of it. Well, well, number one, I don't like doing anything for money that's not needed. Uh, why, Clyde, what would be your advice about just doing what the governor's office says do? Or, or even recommends? I mean, a lot of what he's doing is recommend, recommending uh, right. things. Well, his, his rule, his executive order <clears throat> uh, preempts any county order unless, unless the county has some reason to be even more strict um, in, in the declaration. So his office really uh, sets the tone. <clears throat> okay, well, simply put in laid terms, forgive me for not knowing, are we more strict than what he's doing now in Raleigh in certain areas? No. Not that I'm aware of. I think we're following his directive at this point. Well, what's, what's the procedure for extending this? Because my feeling, my gut feeling right now is not to vote for another, an, an emergency order for, from our county. Uh, mm -hmm. The governor is going to do what he does. We're seeing clearly an easing and uh, all around us in the southeast. Maybe <laughs> if he sees it in South Carolina, he'll do it here. Uh, forgive me for saying that, but. Anyway, what, what, what uh, I forgot what my question was. Uh, well, as far as belaboring. as far as easing our order, if the governor should today say that on Wednesday he's going to increase social gatherings to fifty, we can certainly amend our order. I don't think our order. Well, again, anything. what would forgive me, but what would be the purpose of our ordinance if he's doing that and we're going to abide by it? I think other you, than to say money. Well, I think you would have to listen to our public health director, and she just presented um, a graph that showed that there was a slight increase in the cases, and that's why she she advises maintain social distancing. Uh, every county is different, and um, we may not have as much increase as somebody like Wake or Durham or Mecklenburg. So I think she should be the one, along with our emergency management folks, uh, to cue us on what we need to do and when we need to do it. Our state of emergency, Mr. Sutton, is, does not do anything beyond what the um, what the governor's executive orders have done. We haven't had any kind of limitation, restriction on individuals in Alamance County beyond what the state has done. I'm not sure if that's true of Burlington. I think Burlington, it, sometimes they've done more and then they've backed off of it. I kind of lost track of um, where they where they were with all of that. Um, we originally did our first state of emergency on March the 20th, and that is when we had our first confirmed case of COVID in the county. Um, and the reason that I signed that one was because I was told by Debbie Hatfield, our emergency management director, that it would help with getting reimbursed for COVID-related expenses by FEMA, and it may help some of our small businesses or other businesses in Alamance County with getting federal aid. And um, so that's why we did it then, and we've kind of kept it going since then. It's been uh, really a financial thing and less of a actual restriction on anybody's personal liberties in Alamance County. Now, I've had a number of people approach me and comment about opening up Alamance County and I've had to point out that we didn't close Alamance County. The state closed Alamance County. They closed it for us. So uh, uh, I want to make sure the people of county know that we didn't close it, but yeah. we are trying to do things to help our citizens, such small businesses, if they can get money because we've declared a state of emergency. That's a good <coughs> thing for the small businesses in the county. It would definitely be a nasty shock to find out that a small business um, or a local government in Alamance County didn't get access to some kind of aid or funding because we had let the ball drop on having a state of emergency declared. 
that would be very unfortunate. So, I've had the opportunity to work with several small businesses in the county recently, helping them trying to get funding through some of the banks. And uh, I would hate to see some of the ones that are st have still have applications in the queue not get money because we didn't continue our resolution if we need to. I'm personally not going to vote to extend it. I am not going to vote to extend it. I think it's time to open up the state and the other states also. Mr. Boswell, do you? Well, don't vote, do we? We don't get to vote, do we? Well, no. un under the ordinance, it's the chair's decision to decide if there yeah. is a state of emergency. The only way that mm -hmm. can be overridden is by three commissioners moving and, and declaring that it shall not be declared a state of emergency. I now think that's in our 1987 of, ordinance. Excuse me. Correct me if I'm wrong. The state of emergency is not closing the county, right? That's no, right. it's not. So we're not closing the county. What we're doing is protecting our small businesses in the county if, and, and uh, in the county itself if it needs reimbursement funding from a various sources from the state or from the federal government to be able to have access to that funding by the fact, virtue of the fact that we have a declaration of an emergency. So we're not closing the county with a declaration of an emergency. You are, you are correct. Gov Governor Cooper did that in his executive right. order where he declared non-essential businesses closed. Mr. Boswell, do you have any thoughts about this that you want to share? Um, I mean, I, I do lean towards what Bill said, but the thing is we're under the governor's order no matter what we do. We're in a Dillon state and, and state government overrides counties. Um, I mean, I think it's fine. If that's going to help small businesses, I think we should just continue with the state of emergency. All right, Mr. Sutton, anything else? Well, I'll say you're being told that uh, that's going to hurt, uh, but uh, I, I, I haven't seen the proof of it, but uh, I'm just one person. Okay, anybody else have any comments? Nope. Have we done everything on the agenda that we were supposed to do? <laughs> All right. I think we're there. I think we have. All right. If everybody, if uh, we'll be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioner's Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Grand. Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on Local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.